made me stay from that kind of route and I kind of regretted it back then. Sometimes I do regret it, but that's more of a, a, a financial reason. I would love to have played in the NBA just to say I did it and also made a lot of money, but that wasn't the, the passion that I had at the moment, you know what I mean? The longer I stayed in Georgia, the more the music became like an everyday thing to me where I realized that it was actually a, a possibility for me where it's something I could do, you know what I mean? So in high school, basketball was my number one priority, especially, you know, playing basketball in Gwinnett County where I moved it to in Georgia when I first got here, which I live in today. I'm not gonna say which city I live in now, but in high school, I played a lot in Gwinnett County or Fulton County. There was a lot of good talent back then. You know, shout out to Lou Will, Lewis Williams that played in South Gwinnett. I played against him a couple of times. Uh, Jody Meeks, seeing Dwight Howard at a lot of tournaments down here. You know, there's a lot of talent. Your Josh Smiths, Billy Humphreys at Decula, a lot of guys that we play with night in and night out that ended up playing at big programs in college or even, like I said, Lou Will. He's the most highest NBA scoring six man of all time. This is someone I play with in high school on a normal basis. Like, so that was my main focus. I didn't really focus on making my own music and creating that until, until the basketball ended for me. Cause basketball pretty much wasn't a hustle for me. It was something I did because I loved to do it. And it was something that we did growing up. You know what I mean? I still remember when I was, I say third grade maybe. Cause I was, you know, I, I, I was definitely moving around a lot as a kid. Both my parents was in the military. And my dad, you know, before we moved to my hometown, which I consider my hometown, Clarksville, Tennessee, I was in New York with my, my late grandmother, God rest her soul. We was at her house, and I remember my father calling. I always remember this. He called on the phone and talked to the family to see what's up. Well, we was in New York hanging out with my grandma, but he, he asked to put me on the phone, and he said he was looking at houses for us to move in. And I always remember him telling me that the house he thought we were going to get, that we inevitably end up getting, had a basketball goal in the back. And that was such an important thing to us back then. I'll never forget that. And I, I owe a lot to my parents, obviously, like you're supposed to. They're great parents. But not even just my dad, my mom, she really got the game. I got the really the game from my mom, like, at the DNA, because my mom is a four-time, four years in a row state championship basketball player. So, you know, even my little baby cousin, shout out to Jay out there in Long Island, New York, she got a lot of game, too. It's in our bloodline to play basketball, you know what I mean? Everyone in my family is very tall. Everybody got, you know, a lot of athleticism and also the charisma. People don't talk about the charisma that goes into playing basketball. Kind of like my man Jay-Z says, Pete, my swag, I walk like a ball player. Before I even knew what that meant, I knew what that was because it was in my DNA, you know what I mean? So that's why I feel like after basketball wasn't my career choice. It's always been my passion, but since my career choice switched over to hip-hop, I feel like Everything my parents didn't teach me, Jay-Z taught me. And my parents taught me 89% of everything I know now. But, you know, it's probably good 10% of everything else I learned that I was not supposed to learn was through the streets and hip-hop. Mainly, everything else I say was from Jay-Z. It was a very, very, very big inspiration early on for me to see that someone can really transcend from the streets to the industry to actually owning a lot of parts of the industry and having, you know, given us a lot of game from an early on perspective because when I first got into the music, we was in the closet. We was in the closet making music. There was no studios. There was no big A&Rs. There was no big producers. That's not the world that I came up in. You know what I mean? I started really putting out rap songs in like 2005. 2005 was the year I graduated from, from high school. So 2005 was like the first year that I really put out music. And back then, the way we did it was we would, we didn't have Pro Tools yet. We used the, the Sony Acids, you know what I'm saying, the Fruity Loops. Uh, what else did we use? Uh, Final Pro. We really wasn't on the Pro Tools yet. You know, my homie Avery, which is another guy that helped start Strap Town, the original group. He was the first dude I knew that had Pro Tools. This dude was probably one of the sickest musicians I work with in my lifetime, I can honestly say. And shout out to his little brother, Anwar. Hopefully we'll get some music made together, but he's an inspiring artist as well, but his older brother gave us the game. You know what I mean? He was the first dude that really put his hustle up and, and put his money into buying Pro Tools, buying a nice microphone, buying a nice keyboard, you know what I mean? Everybody we knew back then was working on a Fruity Loops demo. 
this cat really had the full the full um, program and really was putting out compilations of his own music and I couldn't believe it at the time of you know we didn't really have YouTube yet it was it was founded in the same year but we didn't know what YouTube was 2005 there was no SoundCloud or there was no Apple Music or Spotify so you got to understand the music that we made we we really just made it for people in the neighborhood the neighborhood I lived in back then was called Summit on the River it's not even called that no more like I said I lived Fulton County which is the north side it's really the, 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 the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. You know what I mean? Like, as a teenager, I never lived in the city of Atlanta. I lived on the north side. The north side is like typically Gwinnett County, Fulton County, even Cobb County. It's kind of like when you hear the Migos say, we from that way. North side, that's what they from, Gwinnett County. You know what I mean? So back then, we made music just for our neighborhood, just for the people we play basketball with, just for the people in the streets, you know what I mean? Just for the people that we knew that went to high school, for the people that party, you know what I mean? We used to start making goofy ass songs like everybody else that started, but that pretty much just gave us the foundation of learning how to get in the, the art of just making and creating your own content, you know what I mean? Like everyone I knew that got into the music back then, we didn't do it for clout like the kids nowadays. A lot of us didn't even do it for money. Well, we, when we started as the way just to express ourselves and, and get that music out there to our homies because we just wanted to create at the end of the day. So that's where Strap Time pretty much came from. A bunch of guys living in the same area that all had the same love for the music. It could be R&B music, it could have been hip hop, it could have been rap. But real early, I had a mixture of music that I was really into. Like, like I said, the two dudes that I used to work with very, very early on in Georgia that we formed a group Strap Time with, it's Canary Valens. You know, he had a lot of, lot of hip hop influence early on, more East Coast. I used to trade him CDs, the, you know what I'm saying, like 8 Ball, MJG, 3 Six Mafia, stuff that I was more familiar with coming from Tennessee. When I moved down here to Georgia, he would put me up on stuff like Street Family, Fabulous, Paul Kane, uh, Clips, Pharrell, even some uh, older Jay-Z music that I wasn't really on. So when I moved to Georgia, I actually got more of an East Coast influence as well, messing with him. And then like I said, Avery. Avery was more like an R&B pop kind of guy, but he also liked rap music. But I was into more of like the teenage stuff back then. Like we listened to, um, uh, what we listened to back then? Stuff like Bow Wow was popular, you know, growing up. Omarion, B2K, Mario. Chingy, a lot of the dudes that, you know, you thinking about back then, we didn't take serious, but a lot of these dudes had a lot of musicianship, and back then, that was what you wanted to be, you know what I mean? Like, the guy group thing was real popular, so we used to really mix up a lot of the genres early on. That's what made Strat Time kind of different than a lot of people I know that made music, because everyone that I know that made music in 2005 was only about the bling, because that was the thing back then, or even the gangster music, you know what I'm saying? 50 Cent was the biggest thing on earth back then, and that's what we was really influenced by. But what I would say is, what got me really working with these two guys is they did it their own way. They didn't do it like everybody I know that did it. Like I said before, the guys in Clarksville that I used to write with, we really never made songs. We were very young, we were in middle school, we didn't have any studio equipment. We would write raps on pieces of paper in math class. And then Mikey Cigars would give it to me in language arts, and then I have a whole period to, pa to pass it on to my homie Black Poet that had to pass it on to the next man. So we was writing raps. We wasn't coming up with songs. At Strap Town, you know, like I said, in, in Georgia, this is the first time I really was creating songs. 2005, fresh out of high school, had my own place.